Welcome to Name Three Songs. I'm Sarah Fagan. I'm Jenna Millian. And this is a podcast where we challenge sexism in the music industry and empower fangirls. Because let's be honest, fangirls knew about that band way before you did. And if you stick around long enough, we'll also let you in on some new music the girls are already crazy about. So, Sarah, what are we talking about today? Today's a very exciting episode because we're talking about indie music, which I feel like is something that we don't really broach that often on this podcast, but is very, like, part of Jenna and my formative music taste identities, which is quite exciting and I feel like something we don't focus enough on because we're always like, pop punk, fuck yeah. Um, (laughs) (laughs) True, we don't. (laughs) I know. It's so sad. But I think part of the thing is, and what we're going to explain in this episode, is that indie is so expansive. Yeah. Like, Sarah and I were entirely different parts of indie culture. And so this episode is really looking at indie culture as a whole, mostly from, like, the early 2000s into, like, the mid-2010s, and kind of, like, the cultural context around it, what was going on. But primarily, we're here to correct history and do a little remembering of all the impact of the girls and the theys and the POCs who had a huge part in making indie culture what it was and maybe aren't always recognized for it. Yeah, exactly. It's such a huge part of the history. And again, this is one of those conversations that is unfortunately heavily gendered, specifically just because of like the time frame that this was going on was a lot of like those who were celebrated for winding up being tastemakers to indie music were referred to as like the girls and fans of this music and so again it's just kind of one of those things where it seems very black and white when it probably was a lot more gray than this conversation or the history on it was actually like acting like it was which is always very frustrating for us but it is a very interesting look back onto something that we genuinely live through as fans and as budding music journalists and just like something where we're also getting to look into like television and film which is something that we don't usually get to discuss a lot which is something I know that a lot of us discovered music through which is a very big part of this conversation today of just like who was picking out this music who was becoming a tastemaker whether they like really realized that that's what their job was or not from picking soundtracks to TV shows and films to going and creating a blog to write about the concerts that they were going to and really celebrating these bands that they were falling in love with as the music scene and the indie scene was growing. And of course today we do have on a guest because we have the absolute perfect guest for this topic. So Jenna, would you like to introduce everybody to our guest today? Today, we are joined by Morgan Bim, who is a writer and recent PhD in the School of Gender, Feminist, and Women's Studies at York University in Toronto. Her research focuses on integrating fan studies, popular music studies, feminist theory, particularly as they relate to the consumption and framing of girly texts, music, and aesthetics. And in particular, she recently has completed a dissertation that she gave us the privilege of reading and we were so happy she did because her project investigates the role of women, girls, and girl culture in the mainstreaming of indie rock music through the 2000s era television, film, and internet cultures. And I would just like to add that you know, this conversation is a lot of thoughts that, you know, Sarah and I have had, a lot of things we lived through, probably a lot of things for you listeners that you relate to and you lived through, but this is the research to back it up, right? (laughs) Like, this is validation that, like, our stories and what we went through was real and we had real cultural impact on the mainstreaming of indie and what became popular and we were the cultural tastemakers of the time Mm -hmm. and that's not always celebrated. So this is a very celebrated episode. Yeah, so we are very excited about this one today. Like Jenna said, it very much so is like a celebration of fan culture and what being a music fan can do for you when you bring it into your job or create something off of that love for music. So it's a very, very fangirl celebratory episode without even really realizing that that's what it was, but it is, which is always exciting. (laughs) So with all this being said, let's get into it. Hi, Morgan. Welcome to Name. Three songs. We're so excited to have you here today. 
Hi, thank you so much for having me. Today's a very exciting episode because we're talking about indie music and kind of how it came to be, who created what was cool, and just, you know, how important the girlies really were. Because I think that a lot of people always correlate specifically like Tumblr girlies with indie music, but the girls were at it way before Tumblr was cool, which I think is something that a lot of people don't think about because indie is such like a broad spectrum idea and it took over way more of a time space in like the early 2000s to the 2010s than I think a lot of people realize, but it can be confusing. So Morgan, since you are today's expert on this subject, can you give everybody a brief little breakdown on what exactly indie music is and just kind of explain it so that people have more of a handle on what we're discussing today? Yeah, totally. So as you already mentioned, Sarah, I think a lot of times when we think about indie, we think of this style of music or this aesthetic that is really grounded in the 2000s or the 2010s, but it actually came out of a much longer tradition. So as far back as like the 1980s, this idea of indie is more of an industrial definition. And what I mean by that is that it was really invested in this kind of punk sensibility of really questioning kind of how corporate and how kind of like mainstream music industry worked and was really invested in things like working with smaller labels, coming up through DIY scenes and like more local scenes and kind of starting to divest the business from the music as it were. And obviously that definition got super complicated as things like the internet arrived, genre definitions in general just got a lot more murky, which I know we're gonna talk about. But yeah, that was kind of where indie has its roots um, as part of this kind of longer tradition of rock, punk, but then other kind of like rock subgenres who were interested in kind of interrogating some of those norms. I think one thing you just mentioned that's really interesting that is going to be like a key part of this conversation is that indie, as it kind of originated in the 80s, as you've said, is that it lived through a lot of technological change and a lot of cultural change. And that's probably why it's such a unique and interesting thing to like look back on and study. Because personally, my introduction to the world of indie was like when I was in high school, I was in pop punk and it wasn't until like later in high school and when I was in college, like 2013 and 2014 when I was like on Tumblr my bands were like the 1975 Two Door Cinema Club the Wombats Arctic Monkeys but like Arctic Monkeys AM record like Arctic Monkeys did not exist to me pre-AM so I know that like I am very late to this conversation so it's really interesting to me like going through your dissertation and this conversation looking at like how much led up to that point because like the indie that I know was pretty commercialized at that point like Arctic Monkeys were a huge thing in 2014 and probably had some real label support so it's that version of indie which i think a lot of people probably and the younger generations probably identify as indie is very different than how indie originally started for sure yeah your point about technology is right on the nose i think like it really kind of spanned this era from making mixtapes on like cassettes yeah. Um, all the way up until this like influx of like streaming cultures in the 2010s. And another really important thing to note that happened during that time, right, was this time in the 90s when a lot of pouring communications law was changing, so I won't get into it. But it really changed the way that things like radio play worked. Major labels were really trying to kind of market themselves as kind of, you know, invested in these same kinds of aesthetics and sensibilities. So you had a lot of backlash essentially from indie or punk bands kind of like moving over to a major label. Yeah. Um, the first big example of that was like Green Day. Folks who are a little bit older might remember some of this kind of pushback against certain bands kind of moving to certain labels and becoming a little bit more commercially viable. And I feel like also when it comes to indie, a lot of people always correlate it with like, oh, they have to be independently signed. They have to be this. They have to be that. Like there's this huge checklist of like what it means to be an indie band when like really at some point it kind of became more of like an umbrella term for lots and lots of subgenres and the same way where like me personally would just refer to bands as warp tour bands and it's just like a classifier word is I feel like what indie music has kind of become and I think a lot of fans throughout time get kind of like you said like pissy about bands because it's like oh they went to a major label and it's like okay but like at one po at what point did the 1975's own label that they essentially created like Dirty Hit go from being independent to kind of a bigger thing because they start signing more bands and all that stuff so it's like there's a lot to think about when it comes to that and I think also like you said it's like specifically I think what we're focusing on today is like that 2000s 2010s sort of era of things because there was a lot of 
technological change and because of that there was a lot more power that could be had from the quote-unquote little people meaning mostly like fans of music and kind of like that discovery because again something we've talked about in other episodes is kind of how most genres of music like rock and pop punk and all these things kind of like the girls will find it and then the men will follow and then the men will be like it was always ours and I think that indie is really interesting in that way because before it became more of a mainstream thing in the early mid 2010s the girls really liked it there were obviously guys involved too because the guys were in the bands and then guys were at the shows and all that sort of thing but then you kind of have that like hipster indie man boy vibe thing of like industry dudes that realize like oh I can get in with the girls to like this thing and just kind of like how again it's like this quote unquote softer idea of men that were kind of like masquerading <laughs> in a way to like get in with the girls like I know that I'm dumbing this down but it's kind of similar with like pop punk how it's like oh the girls feel safe with it this is how we'll get to them and then you have all of the fucking nonsense that goes on in pop punk music yeah for sure I think a lot of like if we want to think about it in terms of like indie or like emo kind of like masculinities right and I know that's like academic speak but if we think about kind of the ways that those masculinities are kind of invested in like distancing themselves from these like longer histories of like rock dude bro yeah ism yeah. until like you said you kind of drill down and you're just like oh these things are still happening in these scenes they're just like even more insidious in a way yeah. I mean, a point that you made in your writing and also something that Sarah and I have discussed in the past is I thought it was really cool that you drew parallels to the pop punk slash emo scene because we've discussed at length like pop punk music and how girls loved it so much and you didn't realize like there actually was misogyny laced in a lot of those lyrics until you like actually sat down and like looked at them. And we've talked a lot about like Fall Out Boy and Pete Wentz in particular and like how they were playing with the idea of masculinity and gayness and queerness and presenting different ways and how that felt like a safe space for women and for people in the LGBTQ community and that safe feeling is very like anti-hardcore masculinity that you get with rock music or you get with the hardcore scene or like you know these other sub-genres of rock and so it feels safe but it's like a fake safeness because you look at it and it's like oh all those masculine problems all the like toxic masculinity is still there it's just kind of under the covers and so I think that's why a lot of women were more more drawn to this indie scene and also to like points you've made in your dissertation about rock like it felt very gatekeepy and like this is kind of something that we also founded our podcast on of like the can you even name three songs like to this day if you wear any rock shirt somebody's gonna come up like a classic rock band they're gonna come up and be like do you even know like three Led Zeppelin songs so I think because of indie being this offshoot of rock it felt like oh this is something that we can make ours totally and I think something that's really important to me with this project specifically but just in general is like acknowledging that there can be both like there can be girls and young queer people who like felt really seen and really validated by these spaces and by these scenes and it can be really complicated and connected to like these bigger systemic issues right so I think kind of like holding space for that tension or that duality was something that I really tried to do with this project and I don't I don't know if I succeeded <laughs> so that was something that felt really important to me as someone who has like a, a personal investment in this era and in, the, in this music as well I I mean, I just remember, and I was talking to Jenna about this earlier, but like when I started seeing Arctic Monkey shows, like the crowds were always predominantly girls and then also like older people, which like at the time I was like, oh, these are old people. I have no idea how old they actually were. But like <laughs> to me as like a teenager in high school, it was old people. But I think that they genuinely were like maybe in their 40s. <laughs> I'm like, they could have been 25 or they could have been <laughs> like 50. Age, yeah. <laughs> it was like 2007. You know how old people looked back then. I'm mentioning this because as I got older and grew with the band and as the band kind of went from more like less of like a punky sounding sound to like the more indie rock sort of sound to more kind of just like old school rock sound and they got more kind of mainstream appeal the crowds really shifted and changed and it became this really interesting thing where it went from like oh my fellow cool people to like boys kind of questioning you as like a girl in the crowd being like what are you doing here and I'm like you literally are an Alex Turner cosplay like why are you questioning me 
Like, you're the one being weird here, not not me. And so I think it's just, like, that kind of funny journey of watching a band firsthand really go from something that felt like, not so much like a little secret, but just kind of like a group conglomerate, like, shared love thing to, like, this thing where you don't want to gatekeep it, but you feel like you have to to keep actual gatekeepers out, if that makes sense. And by the actual gatekeepers, I just mean men, usually, because they'll show up someplace that that's existed like in some community or in some fandom that's existed for years and try and put their own stamp on it and claim it as their own and it's just this like really weird thing because again this is one of the few topics that we've talked about really in like this format of name three songs where like we actually lived through it and experienced it while it was happening and especially for me like I watched it shift and change and it's so interesting watching something go from small to big to like mainstream and become some kind of something that the girls were sharing with their friends and their trusted people or whoever was like reading their blog because that was like what a lot of us would do to like something that is being played on the radio and that men are claiming and being like we were here forever and it's like were you I think I would know (laughs) yeah I think that's such an interesting experience of watching those audience demographics change over time Um, I can't say I've ever had that experience but I know for me like my experience with Tumblr and with those online spaces were a little bit different because I think for me as like a a younger teenager and I think a lot of us did this like I fully bought into the like cool music is the only music and like the more obscure the better and like I was just like really hell-bent on being like a pretentious asshole basically at like 14, 15, 16. And then Tumblr for me was like actually the space where I found pop music Mm -hmm. and I fell in love with One Direction and like actually like started to engage with those fandoms. And that was kind of my like galaxy brain moment where I was like, oh, I can like both. And actually these conversations are like directly connected, like the ways in which certain types of music have been, has been kind of framed as like cool or like the good stuff versus Mm -hmm the bad or the girly stuff like that's actually it's all on the same continuum I feel like that kind of goes hand in hand with like how there was that weird section of like the 2000s and the early 2010s where like girls wanted to not be like other girls and not like each other because it's weird because like when you look at the history of like feminism like that should not have happened like at all but I think also in the birth of like tabloid culture and the internet they were very much trying to bring back the girls hate girls girls are always fighting with girls kind of dynamic of things and I think that weirdly and definitely not on purpose but like indie music played a big role in that kind of idea of things because it's like oh like the more obscure I can get like the more cool and different I'll be and like the less I'll be like other girls and like that whole mentality but then when you like go to those shows there's a bunch of other girls like you who think they're also not like other girls so it was stupid because we could have like teamed up and saved the world but we didn't (laughs) And so I think it's just funny because as Tumblr was getting more popular and as indie music was getting more popular, there were other like fandom cultures, like you said, like One Direction or for me, like finding Doctor Who or like sci-fi fandom on Tumblr. Like you go into these other sections of the internet and you realize like, oh, having female friends is cool and fine and I can like share my likes and interests and Tumblr weirdly kind of proved that like you can share what you're interested in with like strangers on the internet and it's not going to like ruin how cool you are because they're just as cool as you and I think that also kind of in a way started to shift with television culture and movie culture in like the early mid 2000s because you kind of have these shows like the OC or movies like Garden State or whatever where like these soundtracks are so ridiculous and like they're so clearly shows and movies that are catering to like a young teen female audience that you're kind of like, oh, well, somebody cool is getting paid to put this music in this show so like maybe maybe it's okay spoiler alert it's almost always alex (laughs) patsavis who for those of you who don't know was just like a very prolific 2000s uh music supervisor he did pretty much every major franchise of the decade (laughs) from the oc to Grey's anatomy all of the things so 
getting back at kind of like the start of how we see the rise of indie music in particularly feminized spaces can you explain Mm. tv as a feminized medium because this was like a term that was like a concept that was very new to me yeah so something that i didn't anticipate doing whenever i started asking these questions and working on this project was a lot of like historical kind of like digging or theorizing i guess Mm -hmm. and whenever it came time to kind of write about these soundtracks I realized more and more like, oh shit, like I am going to have to kind of like frame this in the context of like TV as a medium and like as a historical thing, which was really cool and slightly intimidating because I don't have any training as a historian. It's okay, but neither do what... we in every episode we're like, we need history. <laughs> yep, we we'll wear the facts. <laughs> you just, if there's anything I've learned, if we're all just swinging it, it's, it's <laughs> fine. So, but the more I dug into it, I was just like, oh, like there's actually this like very long, very rich kind of tradition of thinking about TV, mostly because it exists in what we would understand as like domestic space, right? TV particularly before the advent of the internet was this very like grounded medium that was like very tethered to domestic space so if you look at like a lot of tv theory kind of written pre-90s a lot of it is thinking about you know what are the watching habits of housewives who are like staying home through the day which is obviously like a very raced very classed yeah thing that leaves out a whole bunch of people but yeah the the idea that tv kind of existed as or at least daytime TV, existed as a form of media largely taken up by kids and women is this much longer history. So yeah, kind of trying to weave that in. We obviously had this really interesting shift happening in like the late 90s where all of a sudden um, there was a lot of teen TV, like that was kind of a new thing that emerged over the course of that decade. And that came with its own kind of tensions and shifts around programming. And I think a large part of why kind of soundtracks kind of emerged as this this new taste making space can you expand on that a little bit like how did we get from because i know it's very funny that tv was seen as commercial and like it would potentially ruin your indie credibility because indie's like anti-commercial which is also just hilarious thinking back on the history of rock and roll and like television basically helped elevate both elvis presley and the beatles to insane fame so where is the intersection of music supervisors curating indie and that like helping propel indie but also the commercial aspect coming into it i love this question yeah so it's, it's really complicated right so a lot of people will think of music supervision and kind of just think of them making a basically a playlist for the franchise or for the show in question but it's actually much more there's a lot of like legal aspects to the job you have to license things you have like a set budget that's usually really strong So it's actually like a pretty intense juggling act that goes on. In a lot of cases, when I spoke with music supervisors who were working at this time in the in the earlier mid 2000s, a lot of the times kind of the influx of indie or more DIY kind of bands into TV and and film did really just came out of budgetary constraints because soundtracks, they weren't new, but like the way they were using them was a bit newer or like a bit a bit different. And so because this was still kind of a, an untested thing. They weren't sure yeah. how it was going to go. A lot of the times you would have things like certain TV channels would have partnerships with certain record labels. And so they could license songs and artists from that label for significantly cheaper. So you would see things like Buffy the Vampire Slayer using a lot of Warner Brothers artists. Same thing with the OC, like there was a partnership there. But a lot of the times it just came out of, I mean, it's not a sexy answer, but it just came out of the fact that these were often artists and bands who were easier and cheaper to license, Mm. given how much music they were trying to pack into like an hour long episode. While you were talking about this, I was thinking about how you were saying, like, it's not just like a playlist. And like when people are writing shows or movies or stuff, like they'll have kind of like this idea of what music they want in them, but not all the time. Like sometimes there has to be like a person who is like genuinely good at this and like knowing what's going to make sense. And what Mm -hmm. was coming into my head was in the OC in the second season during the infamous shooting scene uh, when Imogen mm-hmm. keeps hide and seek plays mm-hmm. um, which was I would dare say a cultural reset <laughs> for like music and television and just like meme culture and it's one of the <laughs> Because I'm sure a lot of people, if they don't know about this iconic scene in the OC, they know about the SNL sketch with um, Andy Samberg and whomever else was in that. And 
at the time when like that song was picked like there obviously was like thought and effort put into it and it's just funny how it kind of like steamrolled into this other thing because also that SNL sketch didn't happen like right away it happened like a little bit after like once it became kind of like this moment and so I think again it's that thing where they're kind of making fun of a teen girl medium which was the OC but also when you look back on the OC, you're like, oh, this was actually like, pretty good television and like really thought out characters and like really well, <laughs> really, really well soundtracked and all that sort of stuff. And so it's just funny of like choosing to make fun of something that they didn't 100 percent understand because it's like a group of dudes, again, taking something and memifying it or whatever you want to call it. And kind of in a way without purpose I would think like diminishing like the role of the person who chose that song to go into that moment because they're kind of like oh this is silly because there's like this thing that can be repeating and kind of a joke and it's like okay but so many songs like even now like you turn on a tv show and you're like oh wow like the song has to mean something and if you even think about it like in context with right now Kate Bush's running up the hill is becoming really popular again because of Stranger Things and it's like that was a very like specific choice to use that song and like throughout time in movies and TV like there's very specific choices as to like why songs play and like if you think back on it or even rewatch shows like you're like oh yeah like that song's like foreshadowing or whatever the case is because these people put in a lot of work and I feel like it kind of gets forgotten but it's like that same thing where sometimes films or TV shows or even like Twilight, for example, people make fun of Twilight, but also that soundtrack is like iconic, even if you don't like Twilight as a film and people will like buy it on vinyl still to this day. And it's like something that I think was repressed on vinyl recently because people were like so excited about it. And so it was just an interesting thing how like when you talked about this job, like in your dissertation of like somebody who would make would be a music supervisor it was seen as like this clerical kind of just like job that you pass off to some girl in the office because men don't want to do it because there's so much legalities involved and there's so much work involved and there's so much knowledge involved and like you have to know all these things and it's kind of that thing that harkens back to like being a secretary is a really hard job or being a fact checker like back in the day in newspapers like if women wanted to be journalists like they couldn't they just had to be fact checkers but like 90 percent of the time they would actually write the whole article and it's so like a similar job here where they're like oh i don't want to deal with that i'm a man this is women's work and yet the women are kind of trend setting by default but like their jobs that they probably actually wanted there's a few things i want to pull out or like respond to one the first season of the oc does more than most like entire runs of shows will ever do in like their entire like they packed more plot lines and like weird anyways a gift a <laughs> gift to us all and then secondly yeah i think it's really interesting how i mean a few things are happening right like i think we're living in an interesting cultural moment where like a lot of contemporary shows are kind of doing this thing where they're like calling back to previous eras of soundtracks and kind of like music moments so you mentioned the kate bush stranger things phenomenon which has obviously been taking the internet by storm but even things like i'm watching the hulu adaptation of looking for alaska right now which is made by josh schwartz the same the same dude who did the oc and music supervision by alex Batsavis, the same person who did the oc and there's so many weird parallels they're, they're using a lot of like cover songs mm. of the same kinds of songs because it is set in the 2000s so like that sort of thing's really interesting. But like you were picking up on with the Twilight thing, Sarah, it's like, how are these two things kind of remembered as as separate, right? Like yeah. you kind of have your your franchise or your TV show or your other, you know, your other media property. And then you have the soundtrack, which is really cool and actually redeems how shitty and girly the <laughs> the show is or the movie is in Twilight's case. And obviously I'm I'm saying that with all of the all of the irony, all the scare quotes. But yeah, the, the way that these things are kind of remembered differently or like taken up differently with a little bit of space and time is really fascinating to me. And the one thing that I really wanted to stress in this, in this writing, in this project was like, these things are actually like intrinsically connected. Um, and you can't really have one without the other and you can't really have either without this kind of like girl culture that was happening at the time. So you just mentioned like, you know, sometimes when these things happen at the moment, they're not 
always appreciated or it takes us time to kind of look back and I know you wrote also extensively on Jennifer's body being one of those things where it just either didn't hit the right demographic and so it was kind of like a joke and just made fun of and like laughed off but then it's like the primary demographic which should have been young females basically because it wasn't appropriately marketed to them they like later Mm. rediscovered it and was like oh Jennifer's body is amazing and so I guess looking at TV and then also like in films themselves like did you come across anything that discussed why we see this like initial reaction where it's like maybe the initial reaction was even like hey it's good and then it like drops off and then like years later we we look back and we're like oh actually this was amazing yeah I mean the Jennifer's body case is really fascinating and I'll probably do a whole episode on that. <laughs> but I think it really does have ties to, I mean, I know you guys just did a, or you have an episode on like this tabloid culture of the era as well. Yeah. And I think it really was tied to this impulse of just like, oh, we're casting Megan Fox. It's sexy. It's got to be like a sexy male gaze e sex comedy. Yeah. Um, when in fact it was actually like made in the lab specifically for me, like <laughs> young baby queer indie music nerd movie nerd yeah but like like you said like i think it took some time for audiences to kind of get past that initial marketing and that initial pitch um and actually realize that it was a cinematic masterpiece but we're all there now so that's good and so like applying that kind of like thought to these tv shows did you feel like at the time like the oc and other tv shows that had these great indie soundtracks were they taken seriously at the time or Is this like a later cultural appreciation? I think it was always kind of like, there was always an awareness that like what was happening was meaningful or like significant. Like there was a lot of conversation at the time and I found this when I like (laughs) dug through um, for anyone doing any kind of history of the 2000s, like the Wayback Machine on the internet is your friend. I was like digging through all of these like articles of the time. And there was a lot of conversation around like the OC effect, like a band would be featured on the show and then they would just see like astronomical like record sales, concert Mm -hmm. sales, etc. Yeah. And that kind of went doubly for bands who like were invited back again and again, someone like the killers featured a couple different times. So I think, I think there was always an awareness that something cool was happening, but like anything else, I think it's maybe taken a bit of time and space to like realize who the key players actually were in that moment and like where so much of that like taste making power was kind of coming from. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think fans will tell you, right? Like I had, I had so many people like sending me pictures of like their old OC like mix CDs whenever we start talking about doing this project. I think we as fans and as audiences have always known. I think maybe it's just taken a little bit longer for the rest of the discourse to kind of catch up, but yeah, to a certain extent. I think also the thing that is quite interesting is if you also think back to shows like Buffy or Charmed or kind of shows like that, that I think also kind of had that similar audience of kind of like adults, but also like teens or preteens who kind of like would wind up being kind of like witchy queers at at some point in their lives. (laughs) Um, is like the best. That's a fair descriptor. I think it's the best way to put it. Is that all those shows would kind of end with like a band playing at like the hip spot in the show. And I think that, I mean, like, I don't know because I haven't done research into this specific thing, but like, I feel like when I was watching it as a young person, I just kind of was like, oh, there's a band playing at their club, of course. And then like watching it back or even just like as I got older and started being that person who would like take notes about music playing in shows, like you kind of realize like, oh, that band's like actually popular because it'd be like reruns of Charmed at this point. But like, it would be like, oh, that band like wound up being popular or like, oh, wow, this is so cool that this artist is playing on this show and like whatever the case is or even just like a really stupid example of a show that unexpectedly has really good music on it is the reality show made in chelsea on like channel like e4 in england they play like a shit ton of like right now indie bands and so like if you go back and watch like old seasons half of those bands became like super popular because whoever was picking that music to just like play while some posh kid was getting broken up with (laughs) like really knew what they were doing wait was this a this was a reality show yeah reality show with like really fucking iconic music wasn't larkins on there yeah larkin yeah they're like they'll like have bands come and play show show like they'll have so basically like 
Because it's one of the reality shows kind of like The Hills where it's like scripted reality. So it'll be like, yeah. oh, they're all going to a club. But like the club is something that like the show put together. So like they'll have a band play there. It's not like they're actually going to the band's gig. Or things will happen and like music will just like be playing in the background. And so many of the times it's like, oh, I, this band's going to be famous someday. Gotta go take photos of them because it's like always happens. Which I just think is really funny because again, it's like clearly somebody who is on the pulse of like what is cool and up and coming is picking out this music I should have looked into this just popped in my head I should have looked into who picks the music for that show but it's something that's really interesting because I think now that I know that there are people who like put in time and effort into picking that music and it's not just like happenstance like whatever the case is it's like oh somebody like really really thought about this and this band's probably somebody you should be paying attention to which I think is really interesting because like we were saying it's like a lot of these roles were filled by women just kind of by default and then it turned into like an actual career path that like younger people were seeing and like you wrote about in your dissertation and talked to people who kind of like saw those shows growing up and then were like how do I do this and figured out like oh this is like a real job that I can look into and do and then of course once a job becomes popular and people get clout for it then men swoop in and are like that's my job now (laughs) which similarly I think happened with kind of like that blog era that like really was coming up during that same time as like music supervisory roles in TV and film were like becoming like a cool thing to do that like with the internet becoming more popular and people figuring out ways to like share their music or share what was going on like you had young girls who really liked music going out and being like oh I can create a website with like five dollars to my name and share everything that I think is cool from like that song that featured on the OC last week to this weird concert that I went to the other day like at the start of it it seemed like it wasn't they were kind of doing it for themselves and their friends and then as it becomes like more cool to like like music or be interested in the stuff like more people are wanting to start blogs or start working in TV and like picking the songs and picking this music and picking all this stuff where people are like oh without you I would never have like discovered this band and it's like yeah I know I'm so good at what I do with reference to the bloggers as well like again because everything is so kind of like tied into how technology was changing and arriving and like really just like changing the game across the board you had weird things happening where like when the new york scene started exploding or like various like north american scenes started kind of taking off because these like young bloggers were the people with like boots on the ground and like very old like digital cameras in their pockets where they could take like five pictures at a show like their stories and their photos were being picked up by like national outlets which was (laughs) bonkers to realize and like to talk to those people and be like yeah I thought it was weird at first and then you know NME in the UK would just like pay me outrageous amounts for my photos and then it just became kind of normal so like those stories I think are the ones that like we haven't heard very much like the ways in which these things kind of were all connected and like in a lot of cases it wasn't necessarily like music industry folks in their offices kind of like making these calls it was actually like a lot more kind of like grassroots and bottom up and kind of like a lot more fun in some cases too. (laughs) I think a theme that kind of ties throughout all of this is the fact that like when I think about like blogging because like even I started a blog like when I was in high school but obviously a few years after Sarah is like it like wanting to do that just came out of pure like appreciation for like music and like love of music and just genuinely wanting to share that with people. And I know you also had something in your dissertation about a blogger who said that all of their friends would like, after the day after a show, they would all be like chatting them on like AOL Messenger or whatever and be like, how was the show? And they would just like copy and paste the message to all their yeah. friends. And they're like, it would just be easier if I made a blog about this. And like, that's how it started. <laughs> it would take time. I could just and publish I, in one spot. Yeah, exactly. And so I just think it's really cool that like, in a way, all of this comes back to kind of like a fandom or like fangirl type mentality of like, loving something so purely that you want to share it with other people. And I think that's something that also you had noted just going back to the music supervision thing that men who were music supervisors got a lot of credibility for things like sci fi movie soundtracks, because they were also part of those fandoms because they had to be because they had to have that credibility credibility of the knowledge of the fandom in order to be 
successful as a music supervisor. Whereas like we talk a lot about on this podcast, anytime women show their dedication to a fandom or appreciation of music on that level, on that quote unquote fangirl level, it's not seen with credibility. It's actually seen as a bad thing that makes people less likely to want to work with those women, make women not as credible, or like not as um, qualified for these jobs. When it's like looking at this, like how you've written it out and how blog culture started, it's like, no, that fandom, that appreciation, that love is what's behind all of this to begin with. Totally. Yeah. And like the different ways that fandoms kind of read or like taken up I guess like is so so gendered and like this is not news to any of us who've like existed in these spaces but yeah I think it's I think it's it continues to be so relevant and like unfortunately kind of continues to shape the way that we interact with media even though at least on the surface things are, are a bit more chill now um but yeah there's still there's still remnants of that in our culture for sure Kind of as a follow-up to that, something that you kind of noted at the start of your dissertation was the fact that record stores or like physical locations where you gather to see music are sometimes seen as very intimidating to women and queer people and like not inviting. And it's that gatekeeper mentality of like, they're gonna make you name three songs before you're allowed to buy a vinyl record, you know, stuff like that. And so it's kind of like it pushed... It's kind of like it pushed these non cishet men, basically, to other spaces to find this community, to find this way to express their love for music. And it makes sense why blogging happens because it's like they weren't always allowed to 100% appreciate and like show their love of music in certain physical spaces so they went to the internet and like found their communities online and did it there that also just reminded me that like a lot of this started with like the fanzine culture and like the riot girl culture and it's like they were always doing this in ways to make their own yeah I think the thing that has stuck out to me like again and again and again in doing this research has just been like no matter what, fans will freaking find a way. Yeah. <laughs> we will find a way to connect. We will find a way to talk. We will find a way to kind of like push back against some of the, the grosser norms of a particular scene or a particular fandom. Yeah. And so like you said, like this has long roots and like paper, like print zine culture, like way back to like the 80s again. Star Trek actually was like the mm -hmm. first big fandom where like zines kind of became a thing yeah. and again like a lot of that was headed up by women and queer folks and racialized folks who like didn't quite fit into what the franchise had like set up as like their their main fan spaces yeah and then obviously the advent of the internet like you pointed out Jenna like just enabled so much more I think like just conversation I think is the main thing and this is why Tumblr was so impactful too right like it wasn't just that we had the space it was that like folks were actually just like talking and like asking critical questions of like the media that they consumed and loved and you know asking why it wasn't loving them back or like wasn't kind of like building in these spaces for certain certain types of folks so yeah it's it's always been a thing and i think it probably always will be because it's still it's still not perfect and we're still we're still working to make fandom nicer for everybody <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. like that made me think also because I think like back to what I love to talk about all the time is like live journal days of things where like live journal and Tumblr are very similar yet very different in that you can kind of find community very quickly by like a few key search words. But the difference between it was on live journal, you had to kind of commit, you had to join communities and go and comment on posts or make a post and then comments were happening. Whereas Tumblr, you could kind of just like find things by accident because people you followed would reblog things and then all of a sudden you're going down this wormhole. Whereas like LiveJournal was very like curated specific, you know? And I think that that's where like Tumblr was so special when it came to sharing music and all of this stuff because obviously like these music blogs started before that. A lot of these people were kind of just straight up like HTML based website sort of situations using like very early versions of WordPress, etc. And then obviously as time goes on, the internet progresses, it led to people having like Tumblr blogs about music, etc, etc. And it wasn't always just like a blog specifically about one artist. It would be like about a certain scene or whatever the case is. And it's like, it's that thing again, like we were saying of these girls wanted to share their nights or wh where they were going with their friends. And like, the one thing that I thought was really interesting that was called out in your dissertation, and I can't remember if it was you or like you'd quoted from somebody else was that like, 
these women or young girls who were making these blogs, like they never would publish things if they didn't like it. They were never going out of their way to be like, I went to this show and it was crap. Like if they didn't like it, they wouldn't mention it. And if they really liked it, they'd be like, oh my God, this band's amazing, incredible, blah, blah, blah. And so it's kind of like music journalism. And I feel like this is what I've always been passionate about music journalism. It's like, I don't want to stitch somebody up. I don't want to make somebody uncomfortable. And I want to like ask them a question and they feel like, oh my God, like they're going to take me out of context and like say that I said this thing when I didn't say that or whatever the case is where I think that there are a lot of other women in the music journalism space who kind of share that mindset. Whereas like you see men throughout time kind of always trying to get that juicy quote or get something bad. Obviously women also do that. Like I'm not saying that women are perfect, but like more times, like the women's mentality is like fandom first rather than like, oh, scandalous headline first, you know, because fandom can sell just as easily as a scandalous headline can, because if the artist believes that you genuinely care about them, like they'll trust you more and they'll share more and you could get even better stuff that's not going to make them look bad, but like make people care about them more or whatever the case is. But I just think it's really interesting, like with this blog culture, what it started out was like these women were fully just curating things off of their own likes. And because of that, and because they were mainly the ones doing it, like you were saying, like the bigger publications like Enemy or Rolling Stone or Q or whatever it was at the time, like Spin, whatever, they all they had to go off of was what these girls liked and were showing up to and writing about. And therefore, like they inadvertently were curating a whole music scene because all that was accessible for people outside of New York City to, to read about were shows that the girls liked because the girls aren't writing about shows they didn't like. Whereas like men, if they were doing the same thing, would go out of their way to kind of write about shitty stuff, you know, because they want to make other men feel bad for some reason or whatever the case is. And so I think it's just so incredible that somewhat accidentally a group of girls who didn't necessarily know each other and then kind of became the mothers of a scene in some sort of way, like went out to these gigs, wrote about them, and therefore they became like tastemakers forever. And, like, without that, without the access to the internet and the want to share with their friends and the want to just, like, share what they were doing, a whole music scene and a whole group of bands, like, fame kind of rested on their shoulders without them even, like, knowing that they had that much power. And I Literally. Think, <laughs> and I think even at the time, like, I don't think they realized how much power they had. But looking back, it's so blatant and obvious, especially with, like, how indie grew into, like, Arctic Monkeys with AM and the 1975 and acts like that like being so big where like even now like teens are revisiting those artists or like discovering them for the first time and they like still hold up in the same regard that like the Rolling Stones do or the Beatles or whatever the case is. Yeah, for sure. There are so many like male music writers who I absolutely adore who like do approach writing about stuff with that same kind of like unabashed like joy like I'm thinking of like Rob Sheffield at oh, yeah. uh, the Rolling Stone and his writing on like Harry Styles Taylor Swift or anything that Hanif Abdur keep has touched but there does seem to be something particularly at that time at least yeah there does seem to be a bit of a split between and, and again it wasn't just girls but like the folks who had been kind of historically kept out of music writing and the way that they were talking about things and the impulse of folks like the founder of Pitchfork, who like was very invested in this kind of like categorizing and kind of mode of critique versus like you said, kind of just this like wholehearted all in like what you loved and what you saw and what you people would enjoy. Yeah, I think that was a good point because we do say this a lot that like the conversations are always very accidentally gendered due to like the time and space that the events were happening in. And so I think it's important, like you said, to like clarify that because again it's like that thing where kind of at that time it was kind of like you were a girl or you were a guy and those are like the two things that the world were kind of viewing things as and like a lot of like you said like Rob Sheffield's definitely one of like the better male journalists in music who like actually is a music fan but there have been especially I think in the early 2000s like a lot of times you would just read things and you're like they literally just want to make somebody feel bad about themselves and so it's like it's it's an interesting and like frustrating thing because 
you like wind up clumping people into groups that they don't actually belong in just to make it more concise of a story I guess but that was a good point so I'm glad you brought that up it's like a quick habit and like I think the wild thing too is like is so much of that like structure and that like rock writing convention is like entirely self-imposed like yeah nobody makes them <laughs> nobody makes the rolling stone be the rolling stone it was like again it was kind of an attempt to like legitimize rock writing back in like the 60s and 70s at a time when this was like the weird new thing yeah. and then it kind of like calcified into this horrible patriarchal nightmare <laughs> so hopefully we're seeing that shift a little bit i think so anyway mm-hmm. i feel like what you were just saying about like rock criticism became very clinical in a way and like clinical equaling professional and because that was so that like that was one thing and the other thing was like the female bloggers and the again like we're saying female bloggers but I'm like I'm sure there were like POC and like queer people who were also part of this but it's like you know one of those things where we group things together but the people who were doing the blogging it came from this aspect of like there was an amateurism to it I'm sure when they started out but you do anything long enough you get really good at it number one but number two the point being is that it came from a place of love and appreciation for the music and that is often equated with the fangirlness which is not equated with the professionalism or the clinicalism of having rock criticism and so I feel like the bloggers were really Like you said, at one point, there was a certain point in time where they were appreciated because they were the only ones doing it. But then things started to shift and you noted that like women started to be pushed out of these positions and more men were being hired. And also just like in journalism in general, like unfair compensation and like editorial assistants being asked to do administrative work. And you're just like, I don't want to do that. Like, that's not what I'm here for. And so it kind of evolved into this other thing that's very, as you said, kind of like the cool detached persona of like, I'm a rock critic because, or I'm a music critic because like I'm unbiased, which like nobody is ever 100% unbiased but I also think earlier Sarah's point about like the girlies never writing anything bad if they didn't like it like they just wouldn't say anything and it reminded me of Pitchfork's 2.9 out of 10 rating of Jack Harlow's recent album because Pitchfork is like known for like giving bad ratings in general but it's like even if you're writing like a takedown piece any press is good press like it made everyone talk about Jack Harlow we literally spent an entire bonus episode on our Patreon talking about this conundrum with Jack Harlow whereas like the girlies were like I'm not even gonna give it the time of day because it's literally not worth my time and I just think it's really interesting that it's like that was the original influencer culture either like the girlies loved it and it was a thing or it was never spoken of yeah one of my favorite quotes from one of my interviews I can't remember which blogger it was it might have been Sarah Lewitton who's like just like an absolutely prolific like if you google her she was like the heart of the New York music scene for like a hot second there. But she was like, yeah, she's like, I was coming home at 3 a.m. from these shows. Like, I'm not going to waste time writing about something that I didn't love. Like, I was sleepy. Like, (laughs) I had stuff to do. If I was like taking the time to like reflect and like write something or talk about something or review something, like it was going to be, it was going to be worth my time. I thought that was really cute. Yeah. I feel like there was also, I mean, Sarah, I think you'll have like a good impression of this also, but like, I feel like also back then it could have been and I don't know but I'm just thinking like because it was on such a small scale to begin with like the New York like blogging scene and indie scene I'm sure it was you know you could always just like go to your show because your friends are playing or whatever but I feel like now because like music journalism is more established it's like oh well we're giving you you free tickets so it's like you have there's like this implication that you have to write something if you're like signing up as press to go even if you don't like it now yeah I mean definitely the I mean, I'm based in Toronto, Canada. And basically, I know from here too, like, everything has shifted so much. Like, so many small venues have closed, especially the last few years. And so, like, the whole nature of kind of, like, the live show and, like, live show coverage, I feel like, is, like, in a completely different space now than it was 20 years ago. I remember as a teen when I would go to shows and stuff like most of the time I would just go because they'd be like five ten dollars and whatever the case is and I would take pictures and write about them because like I could because there wasn't any rules because they were small venues or whatever the case is and I just remember like as the bands that I liked were getting bigger and I would have to like if I wasn't friends with them if I had to reach out to somebody and get press like Jenna said it, it was hard sometimes because Sometimes a band you really like plays a really shitty show. 
And you're like, what the fuck am I supposed to do now? Because everything I've ever written about them has been like, wow, they're incredible. And this was really bad. And it's it can be hard and like frustrating, I think, because you can go from very much like a passion thing to this thing where somebody's like, what do you mean you don't want to write about the set? And I'm like, well, the singer was singing to the drummer the whole night. And I don't necessarily know if I want, like, if you even want, would want me to write that. Because, like, if, especially if, like, a publicist is used to giving you free tickets because you write nice things and take nice pictures of a band, and then all of a sudden, like, you can't write nice things or even take nice pictures because the singer singing to the drummer the whole show. Like, it's a weird situation to be in. And I think also it's that thing where that shift as a music fan into, like, a music journalist is also very weird because, like, you can, you can be both at the same time. But I think also, there is that expectation once you get to like a certain level of esteem I think is is the closest word word to what I'm thinking of but just of like of that recognition from the people who work with these artists of like the labels the publicist management etc like you reach that point where they kind of like expect a certain caliber of writing or photos or whatever from you and that oh I can send people here to get them to buy more tickets to this show because I know that they're going to write a glowing review because they love this band because that's like the whole point of their blog is just to share things that they love and it can get a bit murky sometimes if bands kind of fall off for a little bit which can happen because you know humans are human whatever the case is and so I think it's just interesting like looking back to like the people who came before because like obviously when I was doing this stuff it was like I think I started in like 2008 and so people were doing this like earlier than I was and like the scene was a lot different things were a lot cheaper things were a lot different so I think that they didn't necessarily like have to sell their soul to a publicist as early as I might have in my fandom journalism career but yeah so I just think it's it's interesting but also like from my perspective of somebody who went to an arctic monkey show when I was in like ninth grade and saw like a woman photographing it and being like how do you do that and her being like oh I just really like music and then I made some friends and like you could do this too and like told me how to do it I think it's just like really incredible that like probably somebody who like was prolific and I'm getting Arctic Monkeys even on that stage was like yeah just go to shows <laughs> take pictures you can do it I believe in you it's kind of like awesome like looking back on it and I just remember like when I read meet me in the bathroom like that it was just that thing where I was like wow if I had been like five years older I would have been so fucking cool <laughs> 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 oh for real i think you're still pretty cool thank you also that's what a beautiful origin story <laughs> I know, right? and so as we all know from this era of not only men sticking women in these roles of like having to pick out music for tv shows and thinking like haha sticking them in the coat closet to do a bullshit job and them actually like changing the whole world and <laughs> music fans starting blogs from their bedrooms to like share their night events with their friends and then winding up being tastemakers for the whole world because that was all that was available on the internet at that time to then the mainstreaming of like indie music and it kind of becoming that thing where it's like now everybody likes this I'm like all I'm like everybody else because like I said like this was the time of like I'm not like other girls feminism which was not feminism in the slightest and these men in the music industry kind of implanting themselves in indie and like manic pixie dream girls becoming the favorite trope of movies and all this stuff and so kind of like the indie girl became this thing where it was no longer cool to be because the normies had taken hold of it and the love and passion behind it kind of just like got watered down because now men were claiming it and the mainstream was claiming it and like all these things were happening that kind of like took it away from like the hardcore fans but because the internet is so fast moving and all these things instead of trend cycles being like every 20 years or every 30 years it's been like 10 years not even since the quote-unquote end of this like indie era being like cool for the teens and even people who live through that era kind of reigniting their love for that music and this fashion and all of this stuff because the teens are into like Y2K fashion and posting on TikTok being like, wow, I wish that I was cool during like the height of Tumblr culture. Like how fun would that have been if I was that age then? I'm like, in that age six years ago? Like, what are you talking about? 
but there's like this resurgence of people revisiting like old arctic monkeys or wombats or like even like the strokes and like the shins and like all these bands that kind of like i haven't even heard their name in like ages but people are kind of like refinding them and it's resurfacing like in this new way because now we have this thing where it's like everybody wants to be a girl's girl now like nobody like there's very little people who are like oh I don't want to be like other girls like most girls want to have like a group of girlfriends and be cool together and so I think for the people who lived through this time it's like okay I can now it's cool again I can like this stuff and look back and realize like how much of a role mostly women but also other people like who weren't just men who have now said that they were the people who made it cool made this cool and now I can celebrate them and celebrate myself and celebrate this but also it's always cool like when teenagers think what you did was cool for some reason like wanting to like dress like you or your friends or whatever the case is because like I'm sure some of these people are seeing like not just like Alexa Chung popping up on like the Pinterest boards of these girls like somebody you knew is probably on someone's like Pinterest board of how to be a 2014 Tumblr girl or whatever the case is and so it's making a comeback and I think it initially started as the fashion was making a comeback, but then the music kind of followed. And the music, which started as music for kind of outsiders and then moved to the mainstream, is now becoming something where we're all okay with liking mainstream music now. And so the fact that everybody's rediscovering this music is like exciting and cool because it's like, oh, I can like this. I don't need to be ashamed of liking something that everybody likes. And I think it's just like a really exciting time for music and that kind of era at the moment. Yeah, totally. I think in a lot of ways, like streaming culture really destroyed our idea of what is. Like everything's just so accessible now in a lot of ways. So I think that's really shifted things. Was there anything that like pointed out where this kind of resurgence started because I think a lot of this is because of just the pandemic and like people having time to like be at home and reflect on things because I remember like early pandemic Twilight was like blowing up all over my timeline and then Jennifer's body as well and it was like it was like a moment for us like people in their 20s to like look back and reflect on like things that were those comfort things as a teenager and like sometimes those things like Twilight for example were things that were like was a huge phenomenon but was never cool you know but now it's like oh no that was fucking cool and I think it's just this like general appreciation of like looking back on like what to Sarah's point looking back on what we did as teenagers and being able to like appreciate that and I think maybe that's how like the younger generation is also kind of like rediscovering that through us reliving those moments. Yeah I mean most of the, most of the articles that I came across was kind of like a lot of this isn't necessarily coming because trends are refreshing every 10 years now it's because of like our generation's very obsessed with nostalgia a lot of this is because of like how shit of a card we've been handed with like everything that's happened because I mean like a lot of our most formative memories of like people between the ages of like 40 and like 27 or like is like 9-11 happening and then the war and then the stock market crash and then the housing bubble and all these things like happening to like not us but like witnessing it happening to other people or whatever the case is and so we really thrive on nostalgia because it's kind of all we have (laughs) which is so depressing but it's like with the pandemic and with a lot of people going back to their comforts people a lot more people were kind of tweeting about like oh remember the good old days or like making tiktoks about that music or whatever the case is and then the teens kind of caught on and then kind of mainstream culture caught on from there and so it kind of went in that cycle of like nostalgia to teens to then teens claiming it as theirs and then older people being like you're kind of doing it wrong but like not being mean to them and like kind of teaching them the ways and then mainstream kind of bringing it back again so it's it's quite interesting like how these articles were kind of explaining it kind of just being like it's just a nostalgia problem that millennials have (laughs) that's definitely a huge part of it and i think another another aspect of it that i'd love to like bring up here is like the shape of it like i said like Streaming's kind of destroyed the idea of a mainstream or the idea of genre a little yeah. bit. But, like, the shape or kind of the the vibe of, like, indie rock these days is so different from, like, mid-2000s, 2010s, yeah. early 2010s. But at the same time, like, once I kind of, like, dug into this, re- like, all of the bands I love now, like, there are so many connections between this era of musicians and artists 
and like the early 2000s like because that was the like we've been talking about with music supervision and and everything in this conversation like that was kind of the the art and the the media that they grew up consuming so of course there's going to be like kind of a direct link between those things and so I think I see a lot of the 2000s reflected in like today's like sad girl indie scene if you think about like your Phoebe Bridgers and your Lucy Dacuses right or even things like I know Karen O of the Yaya Yaz interviewed Michelle's Honor and so like that's a really gorgeous like intergenerational connection like yeah. both of them Korean Americans both of them talking about you know feeling a little bit out of place and like this like bigger rock scene so I think there's so many ways in which yes it's obviously coming from like this big nugget of nostalgia that we all have <laughs> but it's also kind of coming from like it's just it's it's kind of echoes are happening all of the time yeah. and I think once you kind of like drill down into contemporary like rock scenes and indie scenes and punk scenes like there's just there's so many connections it's just like it's actually a little bit mind-boggling yeah that does make a lot of sense and I was just thinking I hope this episode inspires somebody to go be a music supervisor <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to just shout out really quickly. There's a big campaign or there's a big conversation happening right now around music supervisors actually like unionizing and getting IATSE recognition in the States. So if you have listened to this and you're like, oh, music supervision, that's a sick job that I've never spent more than five seconds thinking about. I would just encourage folks to maybe do a quick Google because there's lots of really cool like organizing and conversation happening right now around the legitimacy of this as a job and as a field um, that historically hasn't gotten a lot of a lot of its due one of the girls on who's like our page a patreon member who's on our discord elena wants to be a music supervisor and has been talking about it like quite a lot and how that was like something that she didn't really realize was a job when she went to like study she's like studying something very like musicology yeah music like, yeah his yeah yeah, music history, yeah. whatever the case is. And, like, she didn't realize that could be a job. And then she was like, oh, this sounds really fucking awesome. And she's been talking about it a lot lately. So I feel like she'll be very excited about this episode. But it's cool because it's, like, these things that pop up that you know are, like, important to music history. And then, like, where do they fall into it? And then seeing other people talking about it outside of things. And then getting to do an episode like this where you're like, oh, this is, like, a job for music fans. And, like, how in your dissertation, like, the people that you talk to like the women specifically that you spoke to who do music supervisor jobs and like how they were kind of saying like yeah I wasn't really like musically gifted or like I did music but like I didn't want to do music full time and like how could I work in the music industry and like that's another one of those jobs where like you can be like a huge role in music and like music taste making without having to like make music yourself or necessarily work at a record label or whatever the case is because you could be like it's like oh how do I work in film or tv but like I don't know that much about film or tv but I like really know about music and it's like these sorts of things where being a music fan is a really big selling point and I think it's kind of really awesome how that it always comes back to that about how like if you're passionate about it it really helps in like the same way of like what like you were doing by studying this and like what we're doing with this podcast of like we're passionate about wanting to correct history in a way of kind of being like hey this is these are these fucked up things that were happening that everybody kind of like thought was fucked up or like oh this was like this thing that was really cool that was happening and then men all got the praise for it and it's like okay but that shouldn't have been what it was and it's like that same thing where when we talked about how kind of like african-american women kind of created rock music and get left out of the narrative a lot and it's just kind of like it's not necessarily revisionist history but it's just kind of like when you leave something out or mention it in like a footnote that can do more harm than good in the long run because then you're gonna have people angry and shouting and being like hey remember who actually did this and, like, who actually was, like, the big deal in creating this soundtrack or this blog or whatever the case is. And so I just think that it was really incredible. And Like, Jenna and I told you when we, like, first started talking about this, this has been, like, a thought that Jenna and I both had of kind of, like, Tumblr era indie music. Like, we us kind of understanding and knowing that a lot of women were at, like, the forefront of, like, what was becoming popular but not really understanding how and so the fact that, like, you literally are getting, like, a doctorate in this or have your doctorate in this, it's, like, and study this and wrote about it, it's just, like, so incredible because it's, again, one of those things where it's, like, oh, 
we were not wrong that girlies did this. <laughs> it's always nice to like be reassured of the fact that like, oh yeah, like we were at the forefront, like and genuinely like we like, <laughs> and it's like so crazy to think about. Yeah. And like you said, like just the recognition or just like legitimizing like those other stories that were happening. Like, not that, you know, the mainstream stories that we, we all know or about music history didn't happen. Yeah. I'm sure most of them did. But like there was kind of all of this other stuff happening alongside and like parallel to, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think that the main thing for me that I, and the reason why I chose to kind of structure the project as I did, like not necessarily thinking about the music itself or like, the bands themselves or like fans point blank right because I think there has been a lot of work on even like fans in the last couple years like Hannah Ewens has a really great book called Fangirls there's been Maria Sherman like there's like all of these really dope writers kind of doing some of that reclamation work I think but for me the area that like I got really stoked about and like that I really wanted to kind of explore and like ask some hard questions of was like, like we were saying, like those kind of cultural spaces, like around the music itself and like the intermediaries who kind of were a little bit like behind the scenes or like otherwise like a little bit obscured from mainstream, like legitimacy or like people just like didn't really understand where this work was happening right and so I'm I'm hoping in some in some small way the project and and our conversation like works to works to uncover some of that yeah no I think that's amazing that approach is amazing because it provides so much more context to like what was actually going on in the world and I think that's at times in our podcast we've had to bring in those historical references too to be like actually framing of what happened and what our understanding of these things because like, and also these things it's like to Sarah's points like we lived through this but it's like did we just remember this or like did this actually happen so it is very cool and validating to see all this and like Morgan you have been such a wonderful guest today a great expert for this episode we're really excited for all of our listeners to hear this so thank you very much for joining us thank you so much for having me yeah then girls know everything is the, is the thesis statement they truly do. That's a thesis statement of our podcast also. <laughs> wow, I love girlies. <laughs> In conclusion. <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming to our TED Talk, guys. Love the girlies. I was gonna say, wasn't this the most perfect like dream conversation for us? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. And I've never just like <laughs> It's so nice to like have. I, mean, I feel like we say this every time, but it's always just like so exciting when there's like hardcore evidential validation of like every thought we've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Morgan, you're a gift. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> And I think also because like a lot of this pop culture history stuff we have lived through, some of it we haven't, but I think just like this in particular was like so close to us and our lived experiences yeah that it was very personal and so it was very cool to like discuss something that we actually lived through for once yeah I know because like almost everything we talked about like I paid attention to at one point or another but I mean like I was too young to really know what was going on with Britney Spears or those things when it was happening it's just kind of like afterwards having that interest in pop culture going back and looking at it but like yeah. A conversation like this is kind of like, this is why I'm here. Yeah. Liter- <laughs> which is, I mean, yeah, literally. Which is, which is so crazy because, again, it's like that thing where I correlate a lot of stuff with pop punk, but I think really Arctic Monkeys was kind of a catalyst for me of being like, oh, every person I ever see talking about this is like gr- women. And like I said, like that Arctic Monkey show is where I saw that female photographer and I realized like, oh, I could do this. And so it was kind of like, I yeah. lived this weird double life of being like both an indie kid and a pop punk kid obsessed yeah. with Fall Out Boy that I kind of forget like how important indie music was to me becoming a music journalist. Oh my God. Wholesome. So wholesome. Meanwhile, meanwhile I didn't know that Arctic Monkeys existed before 2013 so, so anyone like, can feel free feel free to drag me for that <laughs> it's so funny though because like there's such a small age gap between you and I that it feels so weird that that's even that like th- things like that are possible but I mean like yeah. I'll, I've met so many people who are like the same like three years younger than me and like still have that thing where like they didn't discover stuff until later on in in the tumblr world or whatever yeah. the case is and I'm like how how is yeah. there this much of a gap? But it's yeah, the same thing where, like, crazy. you miss the Spice Girls. And I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but it's because yeah, I literally. thought the Spice Girls were a band for, like, seven years, but it was, like, two. <laughs> <laughs>
So, I mean, we would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this. I'm sure a lot of you probably relate and have these types of experiences yourselves. Where do you fall in the indie scene? We'd love to yeah. know. Yeah, definitely. Because like Morgan said, I mean, it existed prior to the early 2000s. So this is something that really, like as a genre, bubble, whatever you want to call it, like indies existed forever. But with the birth of the internet, it really became this whole new thing. So yeah, I feel like it'd be it'd be really cool to find out like how many of you guys also started blogs because I feel like almost like every person I've ever met it had some sort of a blog around either a band or writing concert reviews or doing something just because you wanted to have your feet on the ground in music and didn't know how else to do it so if you have any uh thoughts or feelings about that you can come chat with us on social media we are at name three songs on instagram twitter and everywhere else on social media that you can find us we're there or if you have any personal beef with anything we said in this episode or really loved anything we said you can come take that up with us personally i'm at sarah underscore fagan and jenna is at jenna underscore million so thanks for joining us this week on name three songs and until next time never let anyone make you feel bad about your favorite band and remember you're never too cool to listen to indie bands don't forget to subscribe to be notified when each episode comes out and leave us a five-star review they really help if you want to find out more about morgan's dissertation or any of her work you can find more information at name3songs.com <laughs>